many years ago when I was um, doing exam supervision for a year nine exam, English exam that I'd set, I had uh, noticed one of the uh, students uh, had placed their English book open, their workbook open, sort of next to them. And so I called that student out at the end of the exam rather than assume that they had done the wrong thing, called them out, and I started to speak to them. Now this is uh, a very petite little uh, girl, pale, very, very pale skin, blonde, and as I said to her, um, I think you were using your workbook to cheat during the exam, her face just went bright red. It was, it was like I had told her that her mother or father had died. She just broke down and cried, not because she thought she was guilty, but because she thought I thought she was guilty. She said that it was an honest mistake. She was actually the smartest person in the class anyway, and she ended up becoming a lawyer. So I suspect uh, she's now prosecuting people that I, as we go forward. But she said, I'm, I didn't do it, so I just left accidentally my book open. I didn't even really notice it. She did exactly what Romans 6 verse 1 says. Now, I don't know whether she was guilty or not, but her desire to stand up for herself certainly is exactly like Romans 6 here, that she took it as a personal slight, that somebody would have seen in her character something that was so contrary to the way that she lives her life. She thought that it was not something that she would ever want to do. Now, for every uh, one child I've had that say to that to me when I was teaching, I had 99 who were proved guilty, <laughs> bleedingly obviously, as you looked at the exam paper. But this wasn't the case here. So what Paul is doing is he's saying, look, the phrase by no means in our text is much like that. The NIV softens it out a bit. It means really absolutely not. God forbid it. It could not be possibly so. And it's not an intellectual thing, it's an emotional gut reaction that somebody has accused you or have said to you, shouldn't you just go on sinning so that grace may abound? Shouldn't you just do the wrong thing? Just do what you like. Because in the end, you wake up tomorrow morning, you've got a God who loves you, just ask for his love and forgiveness. And Paul goes, gets upset. It's an emotional, it's a gut-wrenching response. Let it not be so. He says it a number of times in our text. He'll say it again in 6.15. By no means. God forbid it. And it's not because it's intellectually impossible to not sin. We know that's not the case. It's an emotional decision. He's saying that I should not want to sin. So you can see it there. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Now, most of you may know, if you've been here over the last a couple of weeks that what he is actually referring to here is what was said in the last couple of months of our talks together, where he's basically been trying to say to the people of God, look, the law was brought in to prove to you that you stuff up. It's not brought in so that you are proved good. It's the old joke. Some of you may drive out from here today and you may... Fly slightly quickly because you're on the run home because the minister wouldn't shut up. He kept talking and so you're 10 minutes late getting to your luncheon. And that little 60 zone that is at Pages Road there, you go through at 75 and you've never done it before. And you get the ticket and you write to the ticket office and say to them, please, I have been a faithful driver all these years. The law is a demonstration of what you've done wrong. It doesn't reward you generally for what you've done right. Which leads some people in the Old Testament to say, well, Paul, if it's true that the law proves when I'm wrong, that I'm not saved by actually obeying the law, then why bother at all? And just to make it worse, Paul, if God loves me and every time I stuff up, he's just going to forgive me, why don't I just not worry about that and just ask for his forgiveness. In fact, I'm doing God a favour because I get to see and you get to see in other people's lives the mercy of God. The more I stuff up, the more I can receive his mercy and receive his love and forgiveness. 
This is the point that they th could throw back at Paul, that if I'm saved by grace and not by anything I have done, then why bother doing anything at all? There's the response, you see. Why can't I just go on doing my own thing and when I am caught in sin or I do the wrong thing, just say, God, forgive me. And Paul's response is basically to call out that as misunderstanding the nature of who you are. And it's a nature of from last week compared to this week. And it comes out, as you see here, where he says, by no means, we are those who have died to sin. In different talks, I've said before uh, that uh, prepositions are life. They tell you the direction that all things are heading in. Past in verse 12 of chapter 5, we had that we died because of sin. We are dead through sin. I would have expected it's to say in verse 1, we are those who have died because of sin. We've died from sin. That's not what it says, does it? Chapter 5, verse 12, we've died because of or from our sin. And it's not, remember, because Adam was just an unlucky bloke who drew the short straw and managed to be the only human being who ever would have sinned if given the opportunity to not. No, because all sinned, verse 12. In other words, you and Adam, me and Adam, we all have one thing in common. Given the opportunity to be the person that Adam was, we would have done exactly the same thing. That's what verse 12 of chapter 5 intimates. Because all sinned, what's the result? Death. If you're not sure if that's the truth, just start living long enough. Eventually, you'll realise we all have the same end point. Physical death is the reality of verse 12. Because Adam sinned, because we are like Adam, essentially in what we would have done, we all die. Because we, like Adam, all sinned. But see, there's a change. And there's going to be a great flip going through this entire passage. We are those who have died to sin. What does that mean? Who have died to sin? It's going to be because of what Christ has done. It'll say it in a moment, as you see. But his argument is going to be, because sin has died, because the effect of sin has died, remember what the effects of sin have been in Romans chapters 1 to 5? They've been threefold. Firstly, death physically. There's going to be an, a change in this in our text today. You may say to yourself, I feel pretty old, I've been to lots of funerals. And so it can't be just about physical death in this world, but you'll see in our text in a moment. There's going to be an overturning of the physical death. There's going to be an overturning of the judgment for sin. Sin is now being, in our text it says, crucified. What does that mean? It's going to be that Jesus Christ has put to death what sin itself did. Death it's, itself, judgment for sin... And the last one won't really come until chapter 8, which is going to be spirit-empowered obedience to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. All three of those things Jesus has actually brought into vogue, into being. And that's what he says in the next four verses. He says, Or do you not know that all of us were baptised into Christ Jesus, were baptised into his death? So what's going to happen here? if we're taking on what we had last week, there's going to be a transfer in all of these ideas from Adam to Jesus. And it's not just merely going from team Jesus to, or from team Adam to team Jesus. A bit like me turning up and saying, look, because I now live in St Mary's, I've decided to follow the Penrith Panthers and not follow St George. Actually, I probably should have said that three years ago, really, if I was going to do that sort of thing, because they've been hopeless ever since, or even prior. But that's not the way teams work. The reason is I'm not a supporter of the team in this analogy. I'm part of the team. I'm part of Adam. I can't get out of the team because I'm literally stuck in Adam. There's only two types of people in this world. Those who are in Adam, those who are in Christ. Those who are united to Adam, united in death, united in sin and the consequences of all those things. Not positive. But you see, the flip side is supposed to be altogether glorious, altogether beautiful. We're going to be united in the death of Jesus. We're going to be united in his burial, united in his resurrection, 
and united in his eternal life. In Adam, we're only united in death and sin. And so there's going to be a reversal of all the things that have held us outside of God's love. And it's a change of identity, a change of who we are as individuals. We're not now united in Adam, we're going to be united in Christ. How so? Well, he says, there are things that you should know. A couple of weeks ago, if you weren't here, I said there were two types of realities in the world. One that's called objective reality and one that's called subjective reality. Fancy words for something that's very simple. You're not sure of objective reality? Do not go and try and run your car into a tree because inertia works. You turn the tap on, guess what happens? The water. Irrespective of whether you believe in gravity. Some of us may say there's better jawline. Gravity works, doesn't it? It's objectively true. Whether you believe it or not, this is what the text is saying. Whether you believe that Jesus Christ died for sin, whether you believe that he was buried to bury your sin, to crucify it, to separate it now between you and God, it's gone. It can be gone. He says a couple of times the phrase may. In other words, you've got to take hold of it. But Jesus has done it. He is resurrected. Whether you believe it or not, it's like gravity. It's true. But actually, he wants to now show us, you can know this for yourself, what we call a subjective reality. You can know it. You can know the experience of being forgiven. You can know the experience of actually moving from being in Adam to being in Christ. There's a subjective difference between these two things. You won't be a different personality, but you'll start to live differently because you are different. You become a different person in the sense of you can have different values, different ideas of what it means to be human. The values of Jesus rather than the values of me or yourself. And it all starts from grasping what verse 3 really means. Or do you not know? The word know is used three times in our text to communicate things that we should know by experience that are true even if you don't feel them all the time, but only if you're a Christian. Do you not know that all of us who are baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? Now, for those of you who are new to the Christian faith, some of these passages may sound completely bonkers. What on earth are they talking about? But it really comes back to the fundamental reason what baptism means. Let me read for you the end of Matthew chapter 28, hopefully a passage as some of you have heard before. It's called uh, the commandment, isn't it? The great commandment that leads on to the great commission. Verse 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism always is about a change of identity. That's what it's supposed to signify. The phrase, in the name of... Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, or God, the Lord, is used over 120 times throughout the Scriptures and multiple times from the New Testament onwards to refer to the Lord Jesus. So baptism is a confessional call. It's a call to say that what God has done for me in Christ, as I take that power on for myself, that God has done something, I believe in it, remember, I'm declared right by trusting what God has done. As I trust in that. God declares that he's going to move me from being in Adam to being united or in Christ. How does he do that? Because I speak, the words don't have the power, they reflect where my heart is, where my mind is, what I know to be true. Multiple times in the rest of the New Testament, in fact, one of them is in a few chapters time in Romans chapter 10. It says this in Romans 10 verse 13, back to verse 12, For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, a big argument within Romans itself. Why? Because the same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. To call is a respect of where my identity now lies. And I won't read out all the others, but there are literally dozens throughout most of Paul's letters and some of John and Peter too that the baptism is a desire to say to 
everyone out loud what has already occurred in your heart, that I call on the name of the Lord. That's not like a magic formula. It's a call of what you know to be true, that Jesus Christ has baptised me by his death. How so? Because he crucified death, which is a fancy way of saying that death now has no mastery, no victory. Now, death, remember, from Genesis 2 and 3 last week, was more than just physical death. The physical death of Adam took 900 odd years to catch up to the spiritual reality. Remember the promise? Genesis 2, 16 and onwards. If you eat from the tree that is in the garden, you will surely die. The Satan turns up to test Adam really in his ability to communicate to Eve the same promise. And he says, you will not surely die. When God turns up, does he, Adam? No. But spiritually, yes. In 323, Adam is kicked out of the garden. The bars are put up with the cherubim and he is not allowed in, communicating a spiritual separation between him and God, with the idea being that his physical death will eventually catch up to the spiritual reality that sadly he has gone through, unless he is, like you, like me, born again. Born again. How does that happen? Verses 3 to 6, how that happened. We are baptised into Christ Jesus, who are baptised into his death. And so there comes a dualism through the text now. Adam sinned, we all die. The proof of that is just live a few more years and you'll see it, sadly. Many of you have seen it already. Brothers, sisters, your parents, your grandparents. It's the reality we all know. Why? Because of sin. Our sin and the judgment that flows from that. Jesus, it says here, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. So in Adam, death. In Christ, Jesus kills death. In other words, the death as the result of sin now has no mastery over you, no consequence. You may die in this world, but eventually... The spirit that is living in you will catch up to your physical life and they'll be united together. That's the resurrected life. Sadly, between now and then, we may go through some pain and suffering, including death. But again, the reversal of Adam has happened. The spiritual reality that from 3.23 in Genesis that was true for Adam, that eventually caught up to his physical life when he died, has been flipped. We have now been born again. And one day our physical reality 1 Corinthians 15, will catch up to our spiritual reality. But until then, sadly, we will have this wrestle within us, wrestling with sin and judgment, but remembering that judgment's been done away with. It's been crucified. It was buried with Jesus. He buried it. How do you know that it no longer has mastery over you? It says it in the text. He's been resurrected. He's alive. He has new life. He tells you in verse 5 then, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, a death, how are we united with a death like his? It's a death that did not stay dead. Remember Acts chapter 2, death could not hold him down, for he is risen. Death cannot hold you down, brothers and sisters, for you are risen. In Christ, you are alive. Yes, there is a wrestle going on, and the text will go on to talk about it, but the ultimate victor does not depend on your victory over sin and death, but on Jesus' victory over sin and death. That is good news, brothers. Good news, sisters. Does it mean you should go on sinning that grace may abound? Absolutely not. Because we start to exhibit and want to exhibit the family values of God. Not to be saved, remember, but to reflect the salvation that has been won for us. We've been united with Christ in a death like his. If that is true, That if Jesus has died for your sin, he's crucified it, he's killed it off, he's taken the punishment. We will certainly, it says, verse 6, 5, be also united with him in a resurrection like his. There's the reality, you see. We can know it for certain that we are assured of our salvation based on the power of Jesus Christ to move you from team Adam to team Jesus. We are united with him. You're going to be united to someone. You're either united to Adam or united to Jesus. They're your only options. How do you know? Verse 6. For we know 
So the question would become, do you know this, brothers and sisters, that your old self was crucified with him? The old self, I think he refers to the Adam self. That old self that is dying a slow death or a quick death, in the end, that itself has been crucified, done away with. The judgment for sin, the result of that sin has been nullified. It has no power over you anymore. No power to condemn, no power to convict. It does have the power to lead to your physical death on this earth, but that's only so that in the end, your new body will actually be merged with your spiritual body and the reversal of Adam will be complete. We will be whole in Christ because we're united to him. Our old self, verse 6, has been crucified so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That's 1 Corinthians 15, brothers and sisters. It is going to be done away with. Some of you are probably wanting that far more than others. If you're suffering in this life, if the life that you are currently going through is currently filled with pain and suffering and hurt and trauma, just know one day that the consequences of Adam's sin of which we partake in voluntarily and willingly will also be done away with post this world. It's the hope of the gospel, isn't it? But it's a hope that is not, I hope I win lotto. It's a hope that is so certain that it's as certain as Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection and his coming again. That same process has happened for you. You've died to sin. It's been buried by Jesus Christ. He has enabled you to be resurrected in him so that for the very first time, you might be able to be the person of verses 8 on onwards. Prior to being a Christian, there is only one type of life you can live in Adam, in you, yourself. That is, I have no ability to follow God at all. That's what I'm judged for, you see. But now, there's a wrestle going on. There's a fight going on. But the fight is not like two people pitted in the UFC octagon who may be of equal value. No, Jesus Christ is the victor. He is the winner. You can see it here, verse 8. If we have died with Christ, that means you're a Christian, you confess in him that he is your Lord and Saviour, he has brought you into relationship with God, we believe we'll also live with him into all eternity. For we know, see brothers, you can know it. Brothers and sisters, you know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. You see, last week I mentioned a theological concept which this whole passage is based on called federal headship. That is, we have a federal head called Adam. Like Adam, like I but like a federal government operates on our behalf. Adam operates on our behalf. But if I was Adam, I would have done the same stuff. It only works if Jesus is the flip of that, really. He is our federal head, isn't he? He operates on our behalf between us and God. Praise the Lord for that. And so we get moved by him onto his team so that we experience the same reality that he will experience. He died to sin? No, that's... He died for our sin in order to crucify the sin that separated us. But subsequent to that, you can see, is Jesus Christ alive in heaven? If that is so, then you are guaranteed that same privilege by his power to make it happen, that you will be alive. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. You can see where Paul's going to go. If death has no mastery over him, and sin never had any mastery over him, then sin, remember, resulted in death, no longer has mastery over you. For the very first time in your life, well, hopefully now for those of you who have been Christians, increasingly so, you have the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to actually live for God and to live for Christ that you couldn't do before. You can see it here, verse 10 goes on to 11. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In other words, he's alive in heaven, living for God. You can do that now too, and you'll do it eternally. If you're not sure that's what it means, look at verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
Now, it doesn't mean, as you'll see from verse 12 and onwards, that sin can't impact your life. It just means that when we do sin, we're making a voluntary decision to not live according to the way God has called us. It doesn't mean God's going to kick you out of his eternal house. It means that we have forgotten who we really are, alive in Christ Jesus. You can see it here. Therefore, this all being true, that God has moved us from being in Adam to being united in Christ, all of this is true by God's power through Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign. So he talks here in the original language, it's a kingdom word. The idea that you've been moved from the kingdom of Adam under his reign authority, slaves to that death and sin. I mean, just turn the news on. Just look at your own heart. You've been moved from that to the very first time now have the ability to not live like that anymore. Do not have to gravitate towards those desires anymore. So the easy thing to say would be, the sins that so plague your life now, whether it's an attitude of the mind or an effect of the heart being lived out in action, verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer your, any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. It's more of a weaponry idea, really, in verse 13. Don't be a weapon for Satan, a weapon against your very self. He's saying, it's more like this story that I told at the prayer meeting a few weeks ago. I was over at a nursing home over at Baronia a House there, and I go and see a lady who's not a Christian lady, uh, but like myself, she was a former English teacher and she um, knows a lot about various forms of literature. And she has read parts of the Bible, but not a believer. And she was trying to, I, was talk, I told her the gospel and she said, is it, is it a bit like this? When I was five years old, my earliest memory is I was at home and I got angry with my father and I couldn't even remember what it was about. But I ran out of the house and as I ran out of the house, I turned to him, I said, I hate you. I'm sure all parents have heard their children say that. I hate you. And she said, the only thing I remember is feeling so guilty, so sad. Not because I said it, because I really know I didn't mean it. I was only five and I was upset, emotional at the time. But because I said it to somebody I loved. That is what Paul means in chapter 6, verse 1. Can you go on sinning that grace may abound? In other words, the, the fear and the separation, the pain caused by sin, yes, hurts those in our relationship. But the reason in part that you don't want to do it, to sin, to do stupid things, to think stupid things, is because it hurts our Heavenly Father to see his children live that way. Much like, and she said, I said to her, what, what happened then? She says, the reason I remember the story is that, I don't know how long it was, but I turned and ran back inside, and the only thing I can remember is my father giving me a cuddle. Sounds like the prodigal son, doesn't it? That as the movement of coming back initiates the movement of forgiveness, and it's a sign of, that the father already knew that we are to be loved. He wanted to love but he wanted us to see his love for what it really is. Grace, love, but also initiating a relationship to be united in Christ. And so that's why Paul's so upset. Go on sinning that grace may abound? By no means, surely not. It means you've misunderstood the true nature of family, the family of God. You don't earn God's love by being good. It's got nothing to do with it. That's chapters 1 to 4. It's not about earning. It's about receiving, remember, being declared. Verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. But here's the bit. Remember I said initially that a couple of weeks ago that we often focus on the negative bits in Romans. Do not do this. Do not do this. There may be people in his church that aren't doing that at all. He wants all people to be this, verse 13. If you're not sure, he says it straight up. But rather, in other words, this is who you are, brothers and sisters. 
Yes, I, I know many of us will have sins that we feel entangled by. And the answer to that is to come back to the cross of Christ and to see that he has crucified them, he's put them to bed. But rather, do this, it says. Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. That is who you are. You're alive in Christ Jesus. You may feel sometimes spiritually dead. Remember what I said about subjective and objective reality. Sometimes you need God to tell you he loves you, even though you don't feel it sometimes. You may have had that from your parents. You may have said that to your kids. And they may have listened and you may have listened and not quite grasped the significance of what they're saying. We're all at that at some points, even with God. He's saying, remember, Jesus Christ has brought people from death to life. Brothers and sisters, you may not feel it. Sometimes you don't feel it because you're not a Christian. That can be true. And he says you need to be moved from death to life. And once moved, you may go through periods of your life where the sin so entraps you that you start to gravitate back to thinking like you did in the past. I'm not worthy. I need to earn God's love. I need to pray more. I need to do more good works. And God says I've crucified that thought process in order that you can bask in my love, live for my honour and glory. Why? Verse 14. Sin shall no longer be your master. You've been moved from the kingdom of Adam, now to mix Bible passages to Colossians, to the kingdom of the son he loves. From the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. The kingdom of Jesus Christ. Where he rules, he reigns. And he gives us the reality. Why? Because you are under, see what it says? I did love how that appeared on the screen. Bring the next bit up there. Thanks, William. There you go. You're under grace. That's how we live, under grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are under grace, those of us who know we've been transferred from the kingdom of Adam, a kingdom that we're full-fledged members of, to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And that has happened by Jesus' death. I firstly, Father, pray for those who have not taken that reality upon themselves, that they may see that they, you cannot earn your salvation, you don't earn God's love, you receive God's love. And our behaviour and attitude will increasingly be changed, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. And for those of us, Heavenly Father, who have been Christians here for a long time, I pray that you may continue to shower us with your grace, that we may live for your honour and glory, offer ourselves to you, which means help us, Lord, put into practice to love our neighbour as ourselves, to be the type of people who look for the spiritual benefits in others, who maybe even call other people to account, even ourselves, knowing that we live under grace, not under law. We're declared right, not by our own power to save, but by Jesus' power to forgive his death and resurrection but we also know that Jesus is alive he is in heaven I especially father pray for those who might be suffering here today where it seems that the imminent death given to us all from the sin of Adam that we bask in ourselves we may feel it closely at various times heavenly father as we do feel it closely help us see past our own physical death and see that just like Jesus who was buried, he is now resurrected into eternal glory, and so will we. Amen. Thank you, Stephen.